Let's pray. Yeah. Father, we come before you right now, Lord, we praise you, we thank you, we extol you. Lord, you're an awesome God. You are the one that gives revelation knowledge. You are the one that opens up our minds and our hearts, Father. And so we pray right now, pour out your spirit upon us. Um, open up our minds and our hearts. Reveal to us, Father, um, what you have for us in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, we're doing Exodus-type shadows. Pictures of the Second Coming. And in this, we're going to be, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be backtracking some of the stuff I covered, but whereas then before I was covering it from a different perspective, now we're going to be covering it from looking at some tight shadow pictures for end time prophecy. Uh, the blessing in Hebrew, Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Alom, Asher Natan Lasekhi, Vana Lahavkin, Bain Yom Uvein Laila. In English, Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave the heart of understanding to distinguish between day and between night. Amen. And I just realized I didn't put my tie on. Oh, oh, yeah. I'll live. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We've covered Bereshit. Then we went into Exodus, which is Shemot. And uh, Bereshit was Genesis. And uh, so I'm kind of backtracking on this to give some type shadow pictures. Exodus is Greek, it means a mass departure. Shemot is the Hebrew, it means names, and the book starts out with the names of those that went into Egypt, and then goes into the names of those that came out of Egypt. And we're going through our, our journey through Exodus, or Shemot. And as I've done on the outline every time, the first six chapters were about being enslaved, and the... From chapter 7 to chapter 18 was God bringing us salvation, bringing us out of the bondage. And then chapter 19 to 40 is going to be about sanctification. The life of Christ molded in us through trial. And so what happens on most of this is, as you're going through this, I want, the same way they were enslaved to Egypt, we're enslaved to the world. So I always want us to relate it to our lives, not to people that lived thousands of years ago but to us, and that we are in bondage to this world, that God has brought us salvation, and now He is working out the life of Christ in us through sanctification. And so, the first 18 chapters were about getting Israel out of Egypt. The last, from 19 to 40, are getting Egypt out of Israel. Yeah. It's the same thing God is doing with us. You know, He has basically taken us out of the world, and now... He needs to take the world out of us. And that's where sanctification comes in. All right, Exodus. So, God's people enslaved. Now, verse 13 on chapter 1, he says, So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. And uh, that was showing that they were enslaved. In Revelation 2.10 it says, Do not fear any of those things which they are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. What do you mean ten days? Uh, ten is the number of completion. Yes. Right, 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 let me answer this first. Ten is the number of completion. Is a reference, I, I imagine that there's going to be a specific 10 days in mind that's actually coming into play on it. What, what's that date? To be really uh, serving or tested, do we all have to go to prison in order to be tested? No. Well, we've already been to prison. We haven't already been tested. <laughs> <laughs> we've already been tested. Amen. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> oh, no. yeah. so, We're in our own prison. Okay. So first on it, basically, he's talking about us being in bondage to the world. Second, he goes, God hears their cries. And it says, uh, Exodus 3, 9, it says, Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. <laughs> and then in Revelation 6, 10, he says, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So as you can tell what I'm doing, I'm paralleling Exodus with Revelation. Uh, God sends his two witnesses. 
in Exodus, afterwards Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. They cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? God brings his judgment in Exodus. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in its midst. And after that, he will let you go. These have power to shut the heavens so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. Mm -hmm. God delivers his people out. Exodus, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. And then in Revelation he says, But to the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time for the presence of the, from the presence of the serpent. <coughs> God wipes out the enemy. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Did you paint that other picture of the one you showed? No, I didn't. No, I didn't. That was a cheat. But I do like it. I use it. I do too. Revelation 19:15. Now, out of his mouth goes forth a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. God delivers them to the promised land. Exodus 3, 8. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now, out of his mouth goes forth a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God Almighty. And basically that's a reference to the Millennial Kingdom, where he's going to rule with a rod of iron during the Millennial Kingdom. Now, so you can see basically the parallels I'm putting on it. The same way in Exodus, God's people were enslaved, were enslaved to the world. Uh, he hears their cries. They cry out from the bondage. The souls on the fifth seal cry out, because how long, O Lord, before you avenge our blood? And then he sends his two witnesses. In this case, it was Aaron and Moses. In this case, Enoch and or, uh, Elijah, and I believe Enoch, uh, he brings plagues down, and you know he brought the plagues. He brought twenty-one plagues down, or, or ten plagues down on Egypt. He brings twenty-one plagues down in, in Revelation. Uh, he delivers his people, Exodus nineteen four. He delivers them through the Red Sea. He delivers them out. He says on eagles' wings. The same way he talks about Israel, he gives two wings like an eagle to be able to flee out into the wilderness for the place he's prepared for her. And then he wipes out the armies, and you have the armies wiped out in the Red Sea, and then he wipes out the armies that go against Israel, where at Armageddon. And then he delivers them to the Promised Land, basically he's got a land that he's promised them and coming into, and then he has a Millennium Kingdom that he's delivering them into, where he will rule and reign with them. Alpha and Omega. So this is kind of a quick comparison sum up from the beginning of Exodus on the first part that we covered already. Going from there in Exodus 16, 33 to 36, he says, And Moses said to Aaron, Take a pot and put an omer of manna in it, and lay it up before the Lord to, to be kept for your generations. As the Lord commanded Moshe, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. 
And the children of Israel ate manna forty years until they came to an inhabited land, and they ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. Now an omer is one-tenth of an ephah. So basically what you had is, is this is that this is an omer down here. It's a tenth of an ephah. This is it right here. This is an ephah. And then that would be an omer right here. And basically it was put into a gold basin and it was placed before the Ark of the Covenant. And on the other ones, whenever they would store up extra manna, the next day it would go bad. It would smell, it would stink, it would go bad on them. On the, on the fifth, or on the sixth day, they would get a double portion of manna and then it would stay good for the next day and it wouldn't go bad. Yes? Some of the things you're saying imply that manna was available more than just that one day. Well, yeah, for 40 years. It I was mean, available for 40 just, years. I thought it just came on the sixth day. No. He, he, every no. Day. He, every day it brought manna except the Sabbath. There was no, there was no manna on the Sabbath. Six days a week. So six yeah. days a week they oh, got okay. manna. Never mind. I, I had a different question. I, I, yeah, it's the wrong thing. What's that? And a double and a double portion for Friday night before Shabbat started. So they would get a double portion, and that would be enough to carry them over for the Shabbat. And that was the only one that didn't go bad. And that's the only one that didn't go bad. It's not the only one that didn't go bad. Because the Omer that he had them placed to put in front of the Ark of the Covenant was for a testimony and never went bad. It was bread from heaven that was incorruptible. It would never see corruption. In other words, it was a picture of the Messiah who said, I am the bread from heaven. Mm -hmm. And so in it, what happens is, he's that incorruptible bread that would never see corruption because he would never <clears throat> basically go down into the grave and his body would never rot. Um, so where is it today? Where's the manna today? Where's well, that Omer? The, the interesting thing about that is when the Ark of the Covenant... Disappeared. Most people thought that the inside the ark you had the pieces of the of the Ten Commandments, and you had the rod of Aaron that budded, and you had the Omer of manna. Right. You see it later on in the scriptures where it says in the ark of the covenant where where, where was the pieces of the Ten Commandments. Nothing else. Doesn't mention anything else. Why? Because the Omer and the rod were actually placed before the ark. Because Aaron's rod was too long, it wouldn't have fit in the ark anyway. Right, right. Yeah. So these were placed before the ark. Now, when the ark disappeared, it's assumed. You mean they were like laying in front of it? Yes. Is what you're trying to say? Yes. So it's assumed that when the ark disappeared, they disappeared with it. Okay. So uh, is it coming back? Or? It will come back for the new temple that that's going to be established for the tribulation, but. What I find kind of interesting on it is, in it, you have, first of all, the Ten Commandments, which is the character of God the Father. You have the bread from heaven that is incorruptible, which was a picture of Messiah. And then you had the dead wood that brought, was brought back to life, a picture of the Holy Spirit. But you also have the same thing, or all pictures of the Messiah. Because that's also the character of Messiah. That's also, the new life is also, because he had the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And so usually you see the same descriptions that characterize the Holy Spirit used for the Messiah. And he, well, he was the Word made flesh. So made flesh. He actually is the Torah. <laughs> yes. And the Lord said to Moshe, go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel, also take in your hand your rod which you struck the river, and go, behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moshe did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Now, I did kind of cover on this before as far as the, the split rock that brought forth the water in terms of it being a picture of, of end-time prophecy of the Millennium Kingdom. And this one looks a lot better. Don't you think the water looks better than the last time? Yes. <laughs> it looks silvery. Yeah, well, it's silver as opposed to last time it was just blue. <laughs> blue is good. I worked on it a little bit. 
Um, <laughs> well, you, you said uh, that he spoke, that God told him to speak to the rock, and uh, he struck it. Well, the first time he told him to strike the rock, okay. and water came forth. The second time, which we haven't got to yet, there were two times. The second time he was supposed to speak to the rock, and instead he struck the rock. And that's why God did not allow him to enter into the promised land, because he misrepresented God. So in it, if he had spoke to the rock instead of striking the rock, it would have been a picture of the Messiah's first coming where he was struck, and his second coming. But it was struck both times. And then, as I said, Millennium Temple with the River of Life and the Trees of Life on each side of it. Alright, now, going from there to last week's where we touched on chapter 19. I didn't have time to get into all of this last week because we had to cover all ten commandments. So, I was requested to go back and retouch up on this. So in Exodus 19, 1-2, it says, In the third month, after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they had come to the wilderness of Sinai. Now, the, the, God said that Nisan was the first month, right? Okay. And in that month was the month that Israel came out of Egypt on the 14th, right? So, you have the second month and the third month. This is basically where Shavuot comes in, is three days in after this. Because the third month, when it's saying the third month after Israel gone out of the land of Egypt, it means from the new moon. The third month. But it's actually going from the time, going from the Exodus to where they're at now. For they had departed from Rephidim, had come to the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Yaakov, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me, above all people, for all the earth is mine. That's a pretty nice promise, by the way, you know, if you look at it. Um, that, that was actually, that was my original sketch that I did, that I did the painting on. Revelation 12, 14. But the woman was given two wings of great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Exodus 19, 6 to 8, he says, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So Moshe came and called to the elders of the people, and laid before them all these words which the Lord commanded him. Then all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. So Moshe brought back the words of the people to the Lord. You know, I was going to say, how long do you, did it take from the time they said, everything God says we're going to do? <laughs> uh, Alright, now Revelation 1.5.6, he says, <clears throat> And from Yeshua Messiah, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests, to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So he's made us a kingdom. In the, this is All of these are references to the millennial kingdom. When we are kings in the line of Jesus through the line of Judah, and we are priests in the line of Melchizedek, as Hebrews talks about. Exodus 19.9 And the Lord said to Moshe, Behold, I come to you in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you, and believe you forever. So Moshe told the words of the people to the Lord. And in the chapter 14, or no, I'm 19, I'm going to go back to this one where he says, Then the Lord said to Moshe, Go to the people and consecrate... Them. No, 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 that's not the right verse. It's 
supposed to be 14. It's supposed to be Revelation 14. Yeah. Anyway, I was trying to the where he's coming in the clouds. All right. Doesn't matter. Exodus 19.10. Yes. Is that where the Muslims get their little half uh, symbol circle from the sickle that he's holding? No. <laughs> it's just a sickle. It's nothing to do with it. It's just a sickle. All right. Yeah. Um, you have two harvests. You have the one harvest where it talks about um, Jesus sitting on a cloud and he's reaping the harvest, which is basically about the resurrection. And you have a second harvest where they're thrown into the wine press of the wrath of God. And so you basically, it's, it's part of the parable of the harvest that Jesus was talking about. But um, it talks about him coming in the clouds and everybody seeing him. If you remember on uh, Revelation chapter 1, he says, Behold, he comes in the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and even those that pierced him. And all the nations of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Well, if you look at that where he's coming before Israel, and he comes in the clouds, and the people are terrified. And they, well, we'll keep going here. Then the Lord said to Moshe, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. So there's two days. And he says, And let them wash their clothes. And let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of the people. Now, Revelation 7, 14, 15, he says, And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. Second Peter, he says, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. In verse 10 it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Now, if you're noticing on this, first of all, when he's talking about one day being as a thousand years, he's talking about the day of the Lord. He clarifies that in verse 10, where he says, it will come as a thief in the night. Right? Now, we know the day of the Lord starts at the, during the tribulation time, correct? But if you'll notice here, he's talking about heaven and earth burning up. The elements burning up, heaven and earth passing away. That happens when? Just before the white throne judgment. That happens at the end of the thousand years. Now, <coughs> if you'll notice, basically the first thousand years of history had man's fall. From Adam created to Enoch translated. Then the next thousand years, basically the flood, going from Enoch translated to Abraham entering Canaan. The next thousand years was Israel, and it was from Abraham entering Canaan to Israel divided. The next thousand years was Israel's fall, it was from Israel divided to the temple destroyed. The next thousand years on it, right, you come in, well, from the temple destroyed here, if you go by, if you look at it from Passover time, Right? When Jesus was crucified, and he said, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. Right? You go two days, and on the third day, that brings us to where we are here. The third day will be the Millennium Kingdom, the day that's a thousand years. It's the Sabbath. Notice, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. God makes Sabbaths of everything. One of his names is Yahweh Shabbat, I am sevens. The seventh one is the Millennium Kingdom, when Jesus rules and reigns on the throne, and it goes from first resurrection to second resurrection a thousand years. So in Hosea 6, 1-2, he says, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up. Resurrection. And then it goes on to say that we may live in his sight. Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter rain and the former rain. Now notice, the early rain, 
was about his first coming. It says the Messiah is going to come to us like the rain, like the early rain and the latter rain. The early rain he came to us the first time was depicted in Passover, Feast of First Fruits, and Pentecost, or Shavuot. The latter rain, the second coming, is depicted in trumpets, right? The Day of Atonement, Booth, and the Joy of the Torah, Simchat Torah. So, basically, he was saying in there, he's going to come to us like the early rain, and he's going to come to us the latter rain. That's why these are rehearsals, complications, as he says, for the events that are going to take place in the last days, so that by keeping these, we would understand, recognize, and know at his second coming. Exodus 19, 10 to 11, he says, Then the Lord said to Moshe, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, and let them be ready for the third day, for on the third day the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And 1, 7, as I said, Behold, he's coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so. Amen. Jesus himself say that no one knows when that day is going to be? If you recall in chapter 24 of Matthew when he says, No man knows the day or the hour, not the Son of Man or the angels in heaven, right? Mm -hmm. That was then. Then you read chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 of Revelation, and he says, The revealing, the revelation of Jesus Christ that God the Father gave to him, to show his servants things which must shortly come to pass. He's saying, look, he didn't know then. Nobody knew. Then he died, resurrected, ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. And then it, as it tells you in verse 1 of chapter 1 of Revelation, the Father revealed to the Son the plan for him, and he gave it to John to give to us. And that's what verse 1 and 2 say in the book. So he didn't know when he was alive. He didn't know when he was alive. Nor did the angels. But he knew other things. If you look at it, Isaiah calls him the mighty God. But then when you get into chapter 1, when he's resurrected and ascended into heaven, it calls him God Almighty. It says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the Almighty. He wasn't called Almighty before that. Yes, Ted. This is not a dumb question, I promise. <laughs> okay, uh, that's all right. There's no dumb Sometimes questions. it says he's coming in the clouds, and this says he's with the clouds. What's with the clouds? Is it so he's more visible? Remember in Ephesians where it talks about that great cloud of witnesses? Mm. Right? Remember it says he's coming with 10,000 of his saints on white horses? He's shining so bright that when you look at him, you see white clouds. But if you noticed in my painting... If you look real close at the clouds, you see that it's actually the saints dressed in white, riding on white horses. Right. That's where Ephesians talks about that great cloud of witnesses. And it says he comes back with 10,000 of the saints, and the other scripture says he comes back with 10,000 of the angels. Exodus 19, 12, to 13, he says, You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying... Take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain, or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow. Whether man or beast, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. Now, it, it's interesting, because if you'll notice, he's talking about they're not supposed to go up the mountain. God's supposed to come down to them. Right? Now, in Isaiah 14, 13, 14, he says, For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation, on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High God. See, that was spoken against Satan because he was going to ascend. John 3, 13 says, No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man, who is in heaven. Amen. Exodus 19, 14 and 15, he says, So Moshe went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not come near your wives. I had to, of course, throw in um, <laughs> Ephesians 5, 26, 27, it says... 
that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious congregation, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And then Revelation 14, 4 and 5, it says, These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Ooh, yes, Ted. Uh, I find it interesting that multiple times uh, he's referring to Moses being the one to sanctify the people. How, what authority did he have to sanctify the people? I mean, I thought it was Jesus or God that sanctified. You remember when it, when Jesus when it talked in, in Exodus about, I will send a prophet like Moses? Throughout the scriptures, when they talked about Messiah, they talked about, is this the prophet that would be like Moses, like Moshe, who was going to do this? What authority? He had the authority of God. God gave him the authority to sanctify the people. Well, and they were cleansing themselves. Technically, this is part of the Levitical law where he would have them sanctify them. They would cleanse themselves. They would cleanse their garments. They had to be clean before they could go before God. The, the high priest had to be clean before he could go into the Holy of Holies to sprinkle the blood on the Ark of the Covenant. They, sanctification was something that was done in the Old Testament throughout because God is holy and they had to be cleansed before they went before him. 144,000. Exodus 19, 16, 17. Then it came past the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain, and the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moshe brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. And basically, the long blast is the Zekaya, that's one blast, and it's the call to worship. Now, there is a Zekaya de Gola, and that is a really big long blast, but that one's the call to the ending of the service. So I believe that the one he was looking at there was the call to worship, the first one, the Zekaya. As I said before, you know, you look from the time Jesus was the Passover lamb, and he says, two days, and he says, I will raise you up. And then on the third day, you know, you I'm sorry, two days I will, two days I will revive us, and on the third day I will raise us up. And that's where the resurrection comes in. You have a first, over and over on the day of the Lord, I just got through putting together an index in the back of my Revelation book, just on the day of the Lord. And I think it took up ten pages in small print. Um, there's a lot of references to the day of the Lord in there, and it's not an exhaustive one either. But in it, over and over, you have both references to the first resurrection in it, you have re references to the second resurrection where heaven and earth are destroyed and the white throne judgment comes in, and you have references to both Armageddon, uh, the judgments from the bowls, as well as the blessings through the Millennium Kingdom are all tied in that same one day. Now, over and over, I've heard people talk about, well, the day of the Lord is three and a half years, the day of the Lord is a seven-year period, the day of the Lord... I get all these different things, but Scripture clearly marks it as that, that it's a thousand years and will come as a thief in the night, which is in chapter 16, where the bold judgments are. And if you recall, um, when he's talking about it coming as the thief in the night, it's talking about the second coming of the Messiah. Now, there's a difference between the resurrection and the second coming. But they still all fall within that same day, which is a thousand year period. And you have many references on the day of the Lord, both to the resurrection as well as to the second coming. Which is why so many people have tried to put the resurrection at the second coming. When it doesn't necessarily really go there. Because you have the bold judgments that actually separate them. Which is why in Isaiah, he says, Enter your chamber, he says, Your dead shall live. Enter your chambers for a little while until my wrath is passed. And the wrath is in the bold judgments. And then at the end of the wrath, chapter 19, he's coming in the clouds and he comes <clears throat> to wipe out the armies at Armageddon. Amen. Exodus 19, 18 to 20. 
Now, Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. Then the Lord came down upon the mountain, Sinai, on the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moshe to the top of the mountain, and Moshe went up. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Messiah will rise first. Now I go back to this picture. I wish I had painted I need to do my own version because I keep using theirs. Exodus 19.21-23 And the Lord said to Moshe, Go down and warn the people lest they break through the gaze at the Lord, and many of them perish. Also let the priests who come near the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. But Moshe said to the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, Set bounds around the mountain and consecrate it. And they would never do anything against what God said. <laughs> Matthew twenty two twelve. it says, And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servant, Bind him, hand him foot, take him away, cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You think maybe God's got kind of an adamant opinion about that when you go before the throne of God that your garments have been washed white with the blood of Jesus? Yeah, not on your own. Uh, exactly. In other words, you can't go in on your own and the only way you're going to wash your garments white is through the blood of Jesus. That's why he says he loved us and washed us in his own blood and has made us kings and priests unto his God and Father. Exodus 19, 24 and 25 says, Then the Lord said to him, Away, get down, then come up, and Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through and come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moshe went down to the people and spoke to them. Anyway, then chapter 20 that we went into, that's where it was the Ten Commandments. And I was trying to get this thing to do it where it turns to the heart of the commandment, but I can't seem to get the animation to play on it. You know, basically the bottom's pulling tight, it turns red, and then for each of the letter of the law, it changes to the spirit of the law. For example, when it says, thou shalt not steal, the spirit of the law was that you should be a giver. You know, when it talks about thou shalt not kill, Jesus talked about if you're guilty if you just call somebody an idiot or nothing, of character assassination. And basically, the spirit of the law is you should be speaking life into people. You're supposed to be lifting up all the hands. Next to each other. Well, you know, I know, I should. I, I'm going to do a graphic one because I always have this animation problem and then you can't read the spirit of the law on these. So, you know, hit the mountain. All right, Jeremiah 31, 33, 19. 33, 19, no, not 19, 34. Okay, didn't get that one back, But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. Who's he making it with? The house of Israel. So you better not say, oh, I'm not Israel. Right? After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their hearts, in their minds, and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. So I won't be doing Bible studies no more. <laughs> so we're not there yet. We're not there yet. This so is talking Millennium not, Kingdom. So it's not written on it's during, well, you know, there is an acceptance of it in terms of in the Spirit. Because in the spirit, yes, he's written it on our hearts. We have a heart. If you have a heart for Torah, then yes, he's written it on your heart. Yes, David. After those days, what days are the the, the uh, mentioning or well, referring when to? When he says those days, that's a, that's the reference to the day of the Lord. So when he's talking about those days, he's talking about on the third day you got your millennium kingdom that comes in. So what happens on it? What he's talking about, I believe this is actually going past the millennium kingdom to the new heaven and new earth. In which case, 
Nobody needs to be taught. Everybody's going to already know the Lord. Oh, amen. I'm lucky now. And next week, I'm going to go into the laws defined. You guys got any questions? Oh, Esther. We're early, what, like eight? Quarter to, quarter to eight? Yes. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Whizzed right through this thing. Yes, go ahead. Okay. I have two kind of questions. Okay, I'm good. Sure. I expected not, a lot more questions. I, I, I'm not sure that this, you're going to be able to answer anyways. That's so, right. Okay. Okay. The people turn away from, okay, you've got, okay. God gives them, God comes down from Mount Sinai. Yeah. And they don't listen to them after everything that they have gone through. I mean, they've gone through the Red Sea. Well, we haven't got, got there yet. Okay. We haven't got there yet. Because thus far, they're being obedient. Thus far, they're saying everything that God says we're going to do. But if you recall, when we got into chapter 20, mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember from last week, they said, you know, they were at the mountain, and Moses comes to them, and they said, you talk to God, because he says God's going to come down and talk to you. And they said, you talk to God, because if we talk to God, we're going to die. Right? Right? And they said, we'll do whatever you tell us. And see how long that lasts. So we gotta wait. Okay, that's fine. So at this point, as far as we are now, they have not been disobedient. Okay. Other than some grumbling about food and water. No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then the other is going back on a couple past ones just because I've been watching them. Mm -hmm. um, the 200 oh, year good. difference. I know that was a lot of people. The archaeologists say. That it's 200 years right. difference. Yes. Okay. And from what I see, from what you're laying out, it makes perfect sense. Sense, yeah. So, and I understand they're prideful and they don't want to change their mind. I mean, there's a lot of things. Kind of like thought, evolution, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of things that they don't want to. How do they explain it away? They just disregard it. Well, they say it's not in the right time frame, so obviously it's, it's not pertaining to them. So then a lot, are there <laughs> other people that think of other, I mean, are there other people disagreeing with them? Well, this is, this, as this as this has been being brought out, right. you're starting to get fractions that are starting to go, you know, wait a second here. You know, this is, there's a little bit too much information here to just kind of throw it out. Okay, that's kind you of know. where I was going. I thought these, and there's going to be more and more. And there's going to be more and more. It's going to continue to grow and build. It's kind of like the uh, Jabal al laws, right? As far as, I mean, it's been out for a long time that that's the correct Mount Sinai area. But it's, it's been one of these things that's kind of growing slowly and snowballing in terms of, you know, it's taken a long time going around for people to say, okay, look at the evidence. Look at what's there, right? You know, you, you, the traditional Mount Sinai has no evidence, no anything of, of, of huge groups of people ever, ever being there. Right. You know, and so the evidence on it, usually what's part of what stirred a lot of this is that the naysayers have all said, see, there's no evidence. They, they, none of this, they made this all up. Right. None of the evidence exists. Well, the evidence exists, it's just not where they want to look. Yeah, different location. Yeah. So a lot of it is they're saying, well, see, you know, at the time of Ramses, there's no evidence whatsoever for an exodus. Mm -hmm. They're right. right. At the time of Ramses, there's not. But if you go before the time of Ramses, there's two different Egyptian documents that document the nation Israel already being a nation. Two different ones. Mm -hmm. okay. And it's like, well, how is that possible? And if they're just still in bondage in Egypt. And they say, I mean, we're saying, here's our proof. Right. You ask for proof. You show it to them and they're just, they're just poo-pooing it. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. They all believe, Pretty much. They yeah. all believe in other words, their own research. They're, they all believe their own research. They research this. They do archaeological mm -hmm. information. They do timelines. A lot of the uh, pharaohs and people of substance had different names and different languages. So there's a lot of room for controversy and a lot of room for um, differences of opinion. And they all think that they have the right information. It becomes a matter of, okay, who can prove it to the most? Who can prove it the most? That's the one that most people will believe, but, but they all, you know, can, they all can prove their point of view to a certain extent. I, I think the biggest issue on it, more than anything else, more than anything else, is that as more information comes out, they want to stick with what was already set because they've already got stuff in writing. Right. 
with their names published. With their names on it. Yeah. 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 So as new information comes out, it's kind of like, well, you know, we're sticking with what I already got because right. so that's nothing to do with it. Right. That's what I'm yeah. yeah. So. yeah. Nothing to do with it. Uh, exactly. exactly. It varies. So so they it's it, wrong. Don't forget it, that all. That yeah. These pharaohs also keep, also went by different names, right? Depending on which god these certain people worship, and so. Um, so one pharaoh could have like five, six, or seven different names. Yeah. And during the 13th yeah. dynasty, there were at least five names to every pharaoh. Yeah. What's, what's really scary about the whole thing, though, is that if you buy into a paradigm and you insist that it has to fit in that paradigm, right. and the premise is already wrong, yeah. you've got a lot of other stuff that shifts and is wrong. Right. And so they have to make stuff fit, just like the evolutionists. They yeah. have to make They have stuff to make it fit. fit. Yeah. And that's the difficult part, because they've had to add stuff into the Grecian Empire. They've had to add stuff into the Roman that's, Empire that's timeline. They've yeah. had to add stuff into every single timeline to make it fit, because they have put basically extra years in the Dark Ages of the Egyptian timeline. And, and they have to somehow make it manage to fit. And the people, just because they're not reading the Bible and following the timelines, are not learning this. That's right. Well, it, it isn't even just that, because a lot of them, part of it, as I pointed out in the Bible study on there, it's saying that they built the cities of Ramses and Python, right? So they're saying, see, had to be at the time of Ramses. But they don't look at it from the perspective, like I said, if you look in Genesis there, that they were calling it Bethel, and it wasn't called Bethel at that time. What, what they're doing is they're calling the places by the name that they were at the time the book was written. Which was hundred hundred of years after the events took place. Yeah. Uh, by at least yes. 200 years. I, I know I'm being repetitive of saying this, but what was beautiful when I was at your house a couple of weeks ago, and you showed me a couple of poems and stuff that were written mm -hmm. that showed the events that fit perfectly in that 200 year the, the, the right, thing right. you're talking about. Like, for instance, all of a sudden the rich people became, yes. lost right. all of this stuff. All and of a sudden the slaves poor people had poor. stuff and the rich people were And the were only rough. thing you can think of that can yeah. describe that event is, is when the Israelites just said, okay, you know, uh, Pharaoh, like yeah, they, favor and they take what you want. Yes. And they plundered the place. Yeah. And that fit perfectly in yeah. that poem, yeah. which fit in that <laughs> Not to mention the, yeah, the scroll of plagues that talked about the sea being turned to blood. Have you shared those poems here? Have you shared those poems? Yes, I have. I, I shared them when we were going through Genesis. Yeah. What, no, actually, I shared them when we were going through Exodus. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, first, first Kings still talks, really still talks about that. Yeah. I was just reading First Kings yesterday. Yeah. It's, it's referred to it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We're gonna. Yeah, I was gonna say. What I was gonna do, and now we'll be doing that next week, is we're gonna be going into the laws defined. We went over the Ten Commandments. Now we're gonna go into where God's detailing about how to keep those. And so what I'm doing is I'm subtopicking them with which laws from the Ten Commandments they're fall they're coming from, because some of them cover multiple commandments. Uh, you know. The, you have some of them under thou shalt not steal, some of them may be part of the Sabbath, some of them may be don't murder, some of them may be part so they, they have different references that come under there. For example, it talks about um, the, a rebellious child coming against the parents or something like that, that he should be killed. Well, that's basically a capital law punishment that's in terms of honor your father and mother but it's also, it, it, if you'll notice, it's being put right smack in the middle of all the Thou, thou Shalt Not Murder ones with capital punishments. So I'm gonna be, it's going to be a little controversial next week because Yay. the naysayers, <laughs> the naysayers that are against God, against the Bible, these are used, the, the stuff in the two chapters I'm doing next week are all the stuff they use to throw at us about why God's not fair and why God's not just. And, and it's amazing because it's, a lot of it's kind of taken out of context. A lot of it's kind of taken out of perspective. And, um, and when it's looked at the way they're looking at it, they make it, look, they make it look like God's a big bully and a bad guy. And so hopefully we'll be able to cover that well next week. Ted, did you? I, going back in time in your, your slides, uh, the woman with um, the wings. Yes. Can we, can we talk about uh, the being, she's going to be protected or uh, set aside, to protected from the serpent? Yeah. yeah. And um, 
Yeah. So does this imply that? Does this apply or fall into the same uh, argument that the 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 chosen people of the the people of Israel, Israelites, uh, will be set aside and not go through tribulation, or they will, okay. or they'll be protected through tribulation. The, these are my favorite kind of questions. <laughs> I love these kind of questions. Okay, I'm trying to go back to the picture of the woman given the two wings. And here we go. Yeah, there are two wings. Okay, now. Okay, on this, if you're looking at the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, and you're correlating this with chapter 12 from Revelation, where it talks about the woman who's in birth pains, right? And you guys have probably seen my birth pains chart where I show all the scriptures that talk about Israel in birth pains, Ephraim in birth pains, the leaders of Jerusalem in birth pains, over and over, it's identifying it as Israel. Plus, the dream in chapter 37 of Genesis that Joseph had, Israel himself identifies it as Israel. Where he, where he talks, he has a dream of the sun and the moon, and him, his brothers are 11 stars, and they're all bowing down to him. So, and Israel says, what, show me, your mother and your brothers all bow down to you? So Israel himself identifies the woman as the nation Israel. Plus, over and over, when you look at all the scriptures throughout the Bible that talk about Israel and birth pains, Every one of them identifies it as Israel being the woman in birth pains. So, Israel's the woman here. She gives birth to a man-child who would be harpazo, caught up. The, the word they use from the Latin, rapturos, rapture, snatched up violently. Now, a lot of people have tried to go back to that and give it, tie that on to Jesus, because they're saying, well, you know, it says he's going to rule with a rod of iron. We know Jesus, chapter 2, Psalm 2, right? That he'll rule the nations with a rod of iron and dash the nations like potsherds. But if you go back to chapter 2 of Revelation, you see that the church at Theotira, he says, He that overcomes, I will give them power over the nations. As it is written, he shall rule with a rod of iron and dash the nations like potsherds. He's tying it to not just Christ, but the body of Christ. To those that are going to rule and reign with him during the Millennium Kingdom. So, you look on it. Who's this man-child who's supposed to be brought forth, give birth during the tribulation? Not in the past. None of the stuff in that book talks about anything in the past. If you look at it, when you go through the Olivet Discourse, there's four horsemen. After the fourth horseman, it says, then, this was the beginning of birth pains. It's telling you the time marker for where the birth pains come in for Israel. It's after the fourth horseman, before the martyrs. So this woman giving birth to this man-child, right, who's caught up to God, I believe to be the 144,000, the first fruits of God. Because here you have a being caught up prior to the resurrection, a first fruits resurrection. In other words, like Jesus was the first fruits, because the way the first fruits work, that had to be offered before the harvest. Your first fruits offering had to come before you could have a harvest. We know that the resurrection is the harvest. So there has to be a first fruits before the harvest. And it talks about him being caught up, and then it talks about the woman fleeing into the wilderness for three and a half years. Well, if you go back to the scriptures where it talks about the abomination of desolation that Daniel... Is that when she's being set aside and protected from the serpent? Right. So let's take it in timeline. Daniel already tells you that you're going to have a covenant for seven years. He tells you three and a half years into that covenant will be the abomination of desolation. The Olivet Discourse tells you when you see the abomination and desolation that Daniel spoke of, flee into the wilderness. So the woman fleeing into the wilderness that's given the wings of the eagle is at the three and a half year mark. What a coincidence, in chapter 7, you have the 144,000, and that's right at the part, if you go to chapter 9 in Ezekiel, where it talks about the one sealed with the seal of God on their forehead, just like it talks about the 144,000 having the seal of God on their forehead, right? Is that the abomination of desolation? So, the woman's fleeing into the wilderness, but this man-child that's been brought forth is the 144,000, the first fruits of God who are going to be with Jesus throughout, as you see in chapter 14 of Revelation. So that's singular. You see the man-child is a singular word. 
singular man child is talking about the, this is talking about this body, but the man child is talking about the same way the woman's symbolic of Israel, yeah. the man child is symbolic of these first fruits. But it says after that that he that Satan goes to war with the remnant of her children who keep the testimony of Jesus Christ and who obey the commandments. Yeah. Why would, who, why would you can't he go to war with somebody that's been read, caught up? Remnant. The remnant. Right? The remnant. Yeah. In yeah. other words, in other words, he's talking about. If you've been raptured, you can't go to war with somebody. Hundred and forty-four thousand is nothing. But in terms of being virgins, never defiled by women, that narrows the group down. <laughs> and it's twelve thousand from each of the twelve tribes of Israel. And in chapter seven. God makes the point of clarifying that it is not a symbolic picture of Gentiles that were grafted in. When he says 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh and 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, he's clarifying Ephraim being symbolic of the Gentiles grafted in all the time. He doesn't use the term Ephraim. So instead he says the tribe of Joseph, because if you remove Manasseh from Joseph, you have Ephraim. So without saying Ephraim, he leaves Ephraim in there. <clears throat> as the tribe of Joseph. He does that to make sure people don't try to tie it to the symbolic picture of Gentiles grafted in. So this is only Israel in that first fruit. Sorry, Jehovah Witnesses. <laughs> anyway. Okay. There's two and a half million of them. <laughs> yeah, well, not, you've not, only got 144,000 anyway. It's not a, a huge group. Yes. Well, not only is it only Israel, but it's the 144,000 specifically. Specifically. Right. Yeah. Now, the remnant, though, that he goes to war with. Right. That's us. That's us. That's us. So, what, what you're looking at when you go through this, as I've taught before on it, the fifth seal that's right after the birth pains is the saints that are being martyred who cry out to God and say, how long before you avenge our blood? Right? And what are they told? They're told to wait a little while till the rest of the number came in and they're given white garments. There's the sanctification. Right? Doesn't he have war with us now? Who? <laughs> Who's war at war with us now? The, 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 the dragon. Oh, the dragon? You could say that, but you know, when it talks about when he gets cast down and he knows his time's short, you think he's at war now? Wait till he's cast down and he knows his time's short. <laughs> then you're going to see hell on earth. Then you're going to see hell on earth. Um, so, yeah. So, basically, they, like I said, how long, O Lord, before you avenge your blood? They're told to wait a little while and they're given white garments. Then, in chapter 7, the rest of the number come in all in white garments. So, chapter 8, right away in the beginning, you're right back at the altar where the prayers were offered up, which were, How long, O Lord, before you avenge our blood? So then, God's answer, lightning, thunders, right, boom. Seven angels with seven trumpets. So in other words, the seven trumpet judgments are prayed in by the saints. And it's judgment on those who were persecuting the saints. But God, in His infinite grace, is only bringing third judgments. A third of the trees are burned up. A third of the water seas are turned to blood. A third of the rivers and fountains are turned to blood. He's giving them a chance to repent, to turn around. And that's why when you get to the fifth trumpet, he says, and they still, or I'm sorry, sixth trumpet, they still didn't repent of their murders and their thefts and their sorceries. And, and what you look at on it is basically the whole point of the trumpets is him avenging the blood of those that they were killing and at the same time trying to give them an opportunity to turn around, to turn back to him, to repent. Now, once they don't, you get to the seventh trumpet, and as it says in chapter 10, verse 7 of Revelation, now when the seventh angel, now, when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished as he foretold to the prophets and saints. Well, what mystery, God? I tell you a mystery, 1 Corinthians 15, 51. We shall not all perish, but at the last trumpet be caught up and transformed. Mystery, trumpet, boom, both together. Every mystery of God picture you have through all of the books, especially Ephesians, are all a picture of what we will be in the resurrection. It's our wedding. So you look at it and he says, I speak not of husbands and wives, but of Christ and the church. 
the mystery of Christ in the church. He's talking about that mystery that we be joined together in the resurrection. Are you saying up to that very moment, people have the opportunity to repent? Yep. I was brainwashed that it's, there was a certain point in time earlier than that that you became stuck there. Right. You were like, wherever you were in your condition, God left you like that. Once the seventh trumpet comes in, then it's too late. Once the resurrection's in, then it's too late. After that comes the bold judgment. And he, God says, in them is all the wrath of God. There's a whole lot of wrath. And there's a whole lot of wrath, and it happens in a short period of time. Because if it didn't, there'd be nobody left on the planet. If you look at it, all the waters return to blood. There's no water. How long man lasts with no water? Three days. Three days, right? So we're already at the third bold judgment by that time. What you'll notice is when you get to the sixth bold judgment, it's already talking about Armageddon. It's already preparing the armies for Armageddon, which you find that the second coming in Armageddon fall in the seventh bold judgment. That's why it talks about the hailstones coming down. You look at the second coming of Messiah where the, God has stored up the hailstones for that time. In Job, Job, it talks about in that day, for that day, he stored up the hailstones. And once again, it's the day of the Lord that starts at the resurrection and goes a thousand years to the resurrection. Poor planet Earth. Um, planet Earth. <laughs> yes, the late, great planet Earth. Yeah. Yes. Uh, to your point, I think it's interesting that in Revelation 16, verse 8, then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, causing it to scorch everyone with his fire. Everyone is burned by this blast of heat, and they cursed the name of God, who had control over all these plagues. They did not repent of their sins and turn to God and give Him glory. Where you pointed out several times in the previous chapters how, you know, there were people that actually would repent. Yes. Here, no more Nobody repent. repents. Yes. That's it. Their hearts if you, are set. When you get to that, when you get to where the two, just before the seventh trumpet's blown, you get to the point where the two witnesses, where their bodies lay dead in the streets for three and a half days, come back to life, they hear a voice from heaven that says, come up here. They're caught up into heaven. It says, your dead shall rise. We'll be caught up with them, right? They're caught up into heaven. There's a great earthquake. All these people die. And it says at this point that, that they gave glory to God. Right. It's like you look through all these trumpet judgments. Nobody's giving glory to God. Then finally, just before the seventh trumpet, they're giving glory to God. The last numbers that finally repented that God's waiting to come in yep. for the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And, and that seventh trumpet completes the seventh seal, which means now, that's why it says now the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Messiah, and He will rule and reign forever. So that, why? Because the Kinsman Redeemer scroll has been completed, He now bought back the Garden of Eden that Adam lost. His dominion, His kingship over the earth. Are you suggesting yes. that God is waiting for a very specific number? Well, it talks about till the last number of the Gentiles come in. <laughs> the last number means... I mean, that's a very specific yeah. Number there. yeah, he talks about he talks about waiting for the last number of the Gentiles coming. Yeah. The interesting part is it's still timed perfectly to go with the with the, the final ending of the seventh seal in the seventh trumpet. Because when you get to the seventh seal, the seventh seal is seven angels with seven trumpets, which are prayed in by the saints. When that seventh seal is complete, it's complete at the seventh trumpet. That's why at the last trumpet will be got up and transformed. Because now the kingdoms of the world have become the kingdom of our Lord and His Messiah and He'll rule and reign. So the wedding is at His, his coronation, which is what Simchat Torah is. The joy of the Torah. In it, the Torah, the Word of God, is the bridegroom. And it's led through a wedding procession throughout the synagogue. And everybody kisses the Torah. In Psalm 2, he says, kiss the bridegroom lest he be angry with you and you perish in his wrath at the end of Psalm 2. And you look at it, it's a wedding procession where he's being crowned. It's a coronation and a wedding procession. And when you look at the resurrection, it is a wedding procession and a coronation at the same time. Because now he's become king of the earth, and he gets his bride. Well, thank God only the Christians know that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I, I think that one of the things about a lot of this, too, like with me, a lot of the stuff that I learned when I got involved with Messianic Judaism, it opened up the door to a ton of stuff. Because 
the Gentiles, the Christians had one piece of the puzzle, and they had another piece of the puzzle. And until you got both the information together, you were missing pieces of the puzzle. Mostly what, what it did, the Messianic Judaism for me was, God had already showed me stuff, but what it did is it confirmed it and showed how it tied together with it. Because God had already showed me it, but then he confirmed it. That's why this is a good Bible study. Yes. You know, to your, your point there too, Chauncey, when you bring up the 144,000 as being the first fruits, yeah. um, that takes a, a, a perspective that looks through the, um, through the eyes of the Jew um, to understand that because the mainstream tr uh, church, they, have Doesn't understand. They, they look at, oh, that's got to be Jesus. Right. Yeah, it's like they have no understanding of the chronology and the history behind all that, which makes or they, they and, and most for the most part they don't really understand what first fruits are. Yeah, they don't even realize the the act of giving first fruits before a harvest. Before a harvest, and that and that's that's foreign. You can't have the harvest before the first fruits. The first fruits has to come first, then the harvest right. comes afterwards. And then, and then from your perspective, that's easy for you to see. Yeah, Chelsea. Yes. Um, when we talk about first fruits. Mm -hmm. When Jesus was resurrected, didn't wasn't didn't he become the first fruit? Then? First that, fruit to the resurrection, he did. Who got resurrected into life after yes. death. Yes, and if you notice, the graves opened up, right, and people came up out of the graves according to the gospels. Walk around. Right, and walked around. So he wasn't. He was the first fruit to the resurrection, but that was the early rain feast. Now his first coming is depicted by. His first to come, coming was depicted by the early rain feast. Is it before or after this? I forgot my original question. I think after. There it is. Okay. The early rain feast were depicting the first coming of the Messiah, and you had a first fruits resurrection. Yeah. Right? The latter rain feast is depicting the second coming of the Messiah. And that's when the harvest is going to be, and you have a first fruits of that as well. But, but was his resurrection, did that trigger the end times? Did that trigger the end times? Did that start the clock running for the end times? If you look at the prophecy from he Daniel. he was resurrected from the dead, he's now yeah. alive and in heaven. Did that, for all of us, are we in the end times? I think technically, yeah, you can say from the Not time he resurrected that pretty much that yeah. basically started the end times. Yeah. Well, the, the epistles we had say 2,000 years of end times still. Well, God, and we're God, still waiting for him to come back. So what does the Bible say? No, the epistles call it, at the time of the New Testament, the end times. Yeah. They said we're in the end times. We're yeah. in the last days. Currently. So the, it must have. What, what, the idea of Days, a thousand days, whatever. That, mm -hmm. Basically, what that's telling us is that God's perspective of time is His own providence. We don't understand how He tells time. Well, and if you look in the verse in verse ten, He clearly clarifies that what He's talking about is the day of the Lord. Now, in my index on my book, I put all the references to the day of the Lord, and there are prophecies that go over and over that cover the first resurrection, cover the second resurrection cover heaven and earth being destroyed, cover the lion lying, you know, the, the, I should say the goat lying down with the leopard, and talk about the child playing with the viper, that talk about um, the nations coming up to bring offerings to, at the Feast of Tabernacles to the Messiah, that talk about the offerings that are going to be, you know, basically given during the Millennium Kingdom, the temple that it's going to have there, the river of life that flows from it, the trees of life that are on both sides of it, uh, that talk about the Armageddon, the judgments that are going to come down, that talk about the wrath of God, that talk about the second coming of the Messiah, all of those are in that same day. <coughs> all of them. One day. Every one of them says, in that day. Every one of them says, the day of the Lord. The day, or, or the day of his wrath, or the day of his judgment, or the day of dark clouds. But they all talk about the same day. That day of the Lord that it refers to over and over and over again, that I did ten pages of references for, <laughs> yeah. are all basically talking about events that will take place from the tribulation all the way to the heaven and earth being destroyed in the, in the white throne judgment. And, and that's a thousand years. 
in it when he says a day with the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. In verse 10 he says, for the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. He's telling you that he's talking about the day of the Lord. I believe it. He clearly tells you. And it's both in Old and New Testament. Both. You look in the epistles of Paul, over and over Paul referenced the day of the Lord. That you might be found worthy in the day of the Lord. That you might have cleansed your garments to come before God sanctified in the day of the Lord. Anyway. And that's through continual <laughs> fellowship, being at his feet, reading the word. Well, I'm glad I asked the question. To... Yeah. What was yeah. the question again? No. <laughs> I forgot. I know. I don't, that's why I like these questions, though, because it gets the ball rolling. I noticed that. Yes. See, we were, we were at a quarter to eight. Now it's a quarter after eight. <laughs> we, we covered a half hour just as the questions went. So are we in the time... Are we actually in the time during the, 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 the years of the days of the Lord? Well, that's the whole thing. The end times, technically the end times started as soon as Jesus resurrected. So yes. so technically we've had 2,000 years of end times. So everything's happened right now, right? But here's the thing. Notice this. You want to go back to this. Certain bowls or... See, now here's the catch though. We had 2,000 years, right? Well, watch. Look. Here's Messiah. Here's Messiah crucified. <laughs> Right? 1,000, 2,000. He says, two days, right, I will revive you. In the third day, when you get to the third day here, he says, I will raise you up. He will raise us up. So in other words, the resurrection, both resurrections are in that third day. Oh. Which is the thousand years. Right. Well, guess what? We've had 2,000 years. Where are we at? Where's that leave? What does that leave us in the timeline? We're coming into the third day now. You look at it. How long ago was it that Jesus was crucified? 2,000 years ago. Those are the two days. Now here's the third day where he's going to raise us up. But if you're a pre-trib... <laughs> okay, I can't hear what she's saying. Wait, what are you saying? Is it... Anyway, the Bible says, during the millennium... Um, the kids can play with. Yes, yeah, it talks about, yeah, it talks about the animals aren't going to harm each other. Yeah. It says a child will play with the viper and not get hurt. Yeah, but it's not it says that out. a child will live to be a thousand years old. Yeah. And it says an old man, if he dies at a hundred, will be considered cursed. Wow. That's wrong. In other words, yeah. remember, remember prior to the flood, you had the age of everybody? Like Methuselah lived to be 900, well, Adam lived to be 937 years, right? In other words, he had like a long lifespan prior to the flood, right? That gets brought back. So she's saying, but that's not like that now. That's your question. How come yeah. kids can't play with it now? Because we're not in the Millennium Kingdom yet. <laughs> so it's, we're on the third day, but it's not like the day. Oh. Oh. Well, technically, we're still like at 10 o'clock in the morning. We're, we're between the second and the third in the morning. Yeah. 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 We're very so early in the third day. During that millennium time? Well, and if you'll notice, most of those prophecies... Well, let me clarify something. We haven't completed 6,000 years. Yeah. That's the problem. No, we haven't. And, and most of those prophecies, if you'll notice, the prophecies that Daniel gave are all about the temple. If you remember, the time marker stopped. The clock started with what? The rebuilding of the temple after the captivity. And he said there would be 69 weeks of years. And then it was going to go to the destruction of the temple. Well, guess what? That was in 70 A.D., Right? We haven't got there yet. We haven't been 2,000 years from 70 AD. You see what I mean? We haven't started the third day yet. Now, my speculation that, that the covenant is going to start in October of this year, it's only a speculation, but I look at the fact that if you count 40 jubilees backwards from this year, you end up three and a half years before the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Coincidence? Which means, if they start the sacrifices this year in October, then in three and a half years, in 2021 April, will be 70, will be 40 jubilees from 70 AD. It'll be an anniversary on it. Yes? I was to say, I thought of you the other day. We had a gentleman there in David Rubin, mm -hmm. with the mayor of Shiloh, mm -hmm. and we were asking him questions, and I talked to him later, 
And we question them on Isaiah 53. Well, they believe that that's, that's Israel. That's not Jesus. That part. Right. So we were talking to him, and he's just talking, and he goes, when the church, when the temple's rebuilt, and that's for all the nations to come and go through. And I thought of you because you said, you know, it's they make it like Disneyland. And then yes. God gets mad. Yes. And My thought, view on wow, it is that the reason that God thing. brings the abomination and desolation mm -hmm. is because the abominations they committed is they took His holy temple and turned it into a tourist trap, <clears throat> turned it into Disneyland. Mm -hmm. You think when they build the new temple, they're not going to turn this thing into a money maker? Oh, yeah. It's going to be money. And where Jesus said, it has been written that my father's house will be called the house of prayer, but you've made it into a den of thieves. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what they're going to do. That's the that's abomination exactly. that where God says, you know what? Have no mercy. In chapter 9 of Ezekiel, when he says, he says, seal the foreheads of those that weep over these abominations. And then he tells the ones to follow them after they're sealing the foreheads. And he says, I want you to slaughter every man, woman, child, show no mercy. Starting with the elders in the temple. That's God saying it. Now, and what's going to happen on that is just that. God is going to say, you know what? My holy temple, you've desecrated. Where he talks about... The Gentiles trotting it underfoot for 42 months. And then when you look in Ezekiel, when he talks about the Ezekiel temple, the millennium temple that's going to be during that millennium kingdom, and he says, you know what? Because you let the Gentiles trot in my temple underfoot, you can't come into my presence. I'll let you serve me, but you can't come into my presence. You know why we're serving? Well, during that millennial time, that's when Yeshua is going to be ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. Correct. And what, like if I uh, die before mm -hmm. that starts, what am I just sleeping during that time? Well, if you recall, the first resurrection, right, comes at the beginning of that millennium. So those that are there for his coronation, they're going to be there for the wedding. Okay, so I'm... If you're his, you're going to be in the wedding, right? you got to look at the time frame. Explain your time frame. Yeah, before okay. There. Time because frame. That's what she's thinking. She's right. going to die in the Time day. frame. The seventh trumpet starts the day of the Lord. But what I'm saying is she's saying if she died right now. If she died right now. And but right? we're already seeing Then that you will rise again at, this, so at the time. trumpet when God's voice cries out and you'll be caught up. But she's thinking in the first resurrection. resurrection. First and resurrection. So then, second resurrection is is not for the. If you're looking, not for the saints. them in the air and then come down? Well, they come up. The bold judgments take place. We enter our chambers, like Isaiah says. We enter the honeymoon suite, and just like the traditional Jewish wedding, we spend one week getting to know the Messiah. Then we come out to the wedding feast, which is chapter nineteen. After the bowl judgments. And if you look in the scriptures on it, see the bowl, when he gets to the seventh trumpet, he says, and to destroy those that destroy the earth. It's time to bring my wrath, he says. Well, he says, the time for the judging of the dead and the rewarding of the saints and the prophets. That's the first resurrection. The judging of the dead and okay, the so rewarding of the saints and the prophets. Our, our different bodies. Right, we got new bodies. So when, Immortal during bodies. that millennial reign, yeah. Yeah, We're going to be immortals. Yeah. We are ruling and reigning with him. We have these other bodies that, are, right. that we can do. Well, hopefully. Right. I might be a janitor. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what happens to the guy that dies in the millennium? And like 100. Uh -huh. Where does he well, the reason, the only reason somebody's going to die at age 100 in the millennium is because they rebelled against God. Also, then That's why it says if a, if a man dies at 100, he's considered cursed. And, and if you look at it, you got to remember, he's ruling during this millennium kingdom with a rod of iron where he dashes the nations like potsherds. See, most times people think millennium kingdom, peace, prosperity. It is peace and prosperity. Why? Because he rules with an iron fist. Well, or an iron rod. Now, if you go back to the depiction of it in Solomon's kingdom, right? Solomon was a picture of the Messiah's reign. It started the same way. Adonai was the picture of Antichrist. Tries to usurp his throne. He has to kill him. Same thing. Jesus has to kill the Antichrist. Gets thrown in the lake of fire alive with the false prophet. Right? Then he starts his reign 
of peace and prosperity. But at the end of the reign of Solomon, when Rehoboam was going to become king, they said, your father was a harsh taskmaster that ruled with an iron fist. So you don't think about that part. He ruled in wisdom. Well, he ruled in wisdom. That's why he ruled with an iron fist. So during the Millennium Kingdom, when Jesus rules, he rules with a rod of iron and dashes the nations like potsherds. And it says, right there in the scripture, he says, if the Gentiles do not come up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, I give them no rain. And if they still refuse to come up, I bring the plague on them. That explains why California was in a drought for three and a half years. And he finally did something right, and then he brought all the rain back. <laughs> So this rod well, of right iron is basically Torah. The rod of iron, yeah, is, is you know what? Look, God told you how to do it at the time of Moses. Now, you do it, You we let you, like the time of Judges, where every man did what he thought was right in his own heart. We're at the time of Judges. That's where we're at right now. Every man's doing what he thinks is right in his own heart. Then God says, okay, you know what? You did it your way, and the world almost came to a whole end. So now we do it my way, the way I told you to start with. Yes, Lucky. I find it interesting that, that um, I'm, and I'm generalizing, this is too speaking, that the mindset to accept discipline and hardship and those who won't is, uh, is, is almost easy pr to predict. In other words, yeah. the people who will not accept any tribulation, in other words, no, 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 we're pre-trib, are probably the same people that will not accept the fact that God will rule with an iron fist. Right. Yeah. With a rod of iron. A rod of iron. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's like, it's all peachy, it's all peachy, and, yeah. it's all peachy and keen, God's grace, you know, God's just a God of grace. God's loving, God is love. Yeah. 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 These are the ones that crow the one over it. The spirit, love, peace, joy, yeah. kindness. Yeah. They leave out patience, long suffering. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, 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 I've mentioned that to a couple of pre-tribbers, and that rod of iron is like, what? Are you yeah. kidding? Yeah. No, God, yeah. after in the in the millennial yeah. kingdom. Yeah. 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 Read the There line. is peace and prosperity <laughs> for one reason during the millennium kingdom, and that is Jesus rules with the rod of iron from Jerusalem. That's it. The Lord starts with judgment the with the church, fight. so you have to go through painless, chastised, and fiery trials. Well, God the bull judgments on the earth, right? Right. So then, when we come out of the honeymoon suite week later and have the wedding coronation and feast, the wedding feast, the bulls are already then. Well, yes, I, I actually believe we come out at the seventh bowl. Oh, at the seventh. At the seventh bowl. That the seventh bowl literally correlates. With the second coming of Messiah. What is the seventh bowl? The seventh bowl is the one where he creates an earthquake that levels every mountain on yeah, the planet, right. every island. We're the seventeenth. Yeah. The Remember, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Let every mountain be brought low. Right. Let every valley filled up. Right. Hmm. Well, in Jewish allegory, mountains represent teachings. All the teachings of everything else get brought low, and the mountain of God, the teachings of God, get raised high. Amen. 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 Yeah. So in the new, the new millennium, does, does judgment end for us then? In the new, in the millennium kingdom? Why does he need to rule the, you know... With a rod of iron? Because, I mean, okay, you got to understand, you know, if sin is gone... You've got two groups of people during the millennium kingdom. Mortals, the ones that survived the, the plagues. Now some will survive. Okay. And immortals. Us. Yeah. So you can have two groups of people, mortals and immortals, side by side. You don't think there's going to be some jealousy there? Hmm. All day long, all night long. It doesn't just need Satan to have sin. We still have human nature. Right. Because, see, Satan's bound for a thousand years. But. You still have human characteristics. You still, yeah, you still got, there's people flesh. that, are, if they're still mortal, they're still dealing with this flesh. You just destroyed yeah, my entire understanding of what I thought was true. Yeah. <laughs> I do that a lot. Uh, <laughs> Is that a good Whoa, 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 wait, wait. Go ahead. Those people don't just die and get resurrected too. They don't. I mean, they don't. Nope. Hmm. No. If you're not in the first resurrection, you don't get resurrected to the second resurrection. And that doesn't happen till till God gets so mad that in His wrath, heaven and earth melt. And that's a great white throne judgment. And that's where the white throne judgment comes in. Hmm. So are you saying that in the millennium mm -hmm. you have both resurrected and mortals? Yes. In Christ. Yes. How can mortals who are still in their sinful existence be in the presence of God? 
And, but sin is God. Satan's God, right? Well, if you look at it, the same way Satan that we're going, yeah, we're going Wait through Exodus here, where God literally dwelt in the tabernacle. They literally saw a pillar of fire, where God was literally in the pillar of fire in the tabernacle. Right? Yeah, he kept saying, you can't be in my presence or you would die. Or right. In other words, no one ever really was in his presence. Right. He made his Which is no. why we have a great high priest, according to Hebrews, who intercedes on our behalf before him. Because in the Millennium Kingdom, it talks about God the Father going in the East Gate and dwelling in the Holy of Holies. And that the prince, who's also the high priest, actually goes in to make intercession for us. And he's the high priest that does the sacrifices during the Millennium Kingdom. Yes? But isn't Satan cast down? He's cast yeah, down he's bound up for a thousand years. So, without his influence on these yes. leftover immortals, I mean, yeah. mortals. Yeah, it's all, it's all on them. It's all they, their flesh. So, are they subject to sin still? I mean, yes. We still have flesh. We don't have, they don't have Satan tempting them, but they've still got flesh. As long as you have, look, God's given us a new mind, a new heart, right? This is the same old flesh. Every one of us here has the same old flesh that is still dealing and resurrect, wrestling with this same old flesh until we get the new flesh. So will the Holy Spirit still be around then, or not? Oh, absolutely. But that's the problem people have today. So many people blame their sin on Satan. Well, right. Just the no devil flesh. made me do it. Yeah. yeah. Just yeah. Flesh flesh. <laughs> Flip Wilson. <laughs> Flip Wilson. Yeah. I'm dating myself. So all evil does not come from What is sin? Transgression All of the sin law. does not come from Satan. Yeah. Break the law Satan is the sometimes it's evil. just, he is, but, but sometimes sin is just our own flesh. Uh, it's our own flesh being being influenced yep. by Satan. Now, I think that's the reason why you have a thousand years of no war. But when Satan is let loose, yes. he deceives the nations again. They come like the sands of the seashore and go to war against Jerusalem. And God brings fire down from heaven and burns up earth and heaven. As well as the honest. Then the kill, comes the white throne destroyed. judgment where everybody everybody that wasn't in the first resurrection will be in the second resurrection. Yes. Just uh, you just look at the end of the millennial like a heavenly, a, a godly cleanse. It's like, okay, let Satan out. All these people that are still filled with sin, even when Satan was 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 tied or bound, they followed his temptation to uh, rebel against God, and God does away with all of them. Yeah. So it's right. like it's like the, the last and final cleanse. I, I get it all the time where people are saying, okay, but I don't get this. Okay. He takes the Antichrist and the false prophet and throws them into the lake of fire. And then he binds Satan for a thousand years and lets him loose again. And the reason why is there's a misconception about Satan. <laughs> Basically, if you know it's not this battle between God and Satan, but we know our side's gonna win. If God did not want Satan to exist, he could snap his finger, he's gone. He exists for the sole purpose of God. That's that, that's actually to test the saints to prove who are His and who are not. Right, and He's utilized as a device for that cleanse. Yes, and so if Adam and Eve were tested by the serpent in the Garden of Eden, if everybody throughout history had to be tested by Satan, would it be fair for these people during the Millennium Kingdom to go through an entire Millennium Kingdom and not have to be tested? No, it would not be fair. by Satan. No, no, no. The would be fair. fair. Is not in the Bible. Yeah. So <laughs> God brings in his infinite wisdom and justice. He brings in judgment at the end of that millennium kingdom to allow them to be tempted to prove who were his and who were not. Amen. God's a fair and just God because he's given us the trials and tribulations, so he's going to have to do it to them too. Exactly. Exactly. Everybody, everybody has to go through tempting. Everybody has to go through testing. Everybody. Proving how much we depend on him. Yeah. Proving yes. how much we depend on him. And Amen. if you look at it, you got to remember, okay, you've got maybe a tenth of the world's population, according to Zechariah, I believe, um, that are left after the tribulation, right. after the day of the Lord. Or, not after the, after the uh, Armageddon. Right? That's a lot of people when you consider that eight people repopulated the entire world. Right. Now you've got a thousand years where you've got a tenth of the world's population repopulating the world, we're going to be probably coming really close to dealing with, uh, you know, a a population explosion by the end of the Millennium Kingdom. Yeah. Because 
say well, they'll be also just not stopping at two children. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I guarantee you, abortion will not be legal during the Millennium Kingdom. Yeah. I can guarantee that. That's many hundreds of thousands right there. Well, yeah, you look right there alone. How many people, I mean, every second there's another baby done. Every second. And there's another baby getting killed or somebody dying every second. Yeah. So when you look at, when you think about it from that perspective on it, um, you can see where there'd be a population explosion by the end of the Millennium Kingdom already anyway. All right, are we done? Let's pray. Father, we come before you right now, Lord. We praise you. We thank you. We lift up your name. We bless you. And we say right now, Father, uh, we thank you, Father. Abba, Father. Uh, we love you. Uh, give us revelation knowledge. Give us discernment. Walk, help us to walk in your spirit, not in the flesh, Father. That we would, Lord, glorify you and give you praise and honor in everything that we do and say in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.